now in nine states as coronavirus cases in the U.S. top 500. This morning, thousands of passengers set to leave that quarantine cruise ship off the coast of California with at least 19 people testing positive for the virus on board. This as the State Department now warns Americans not to travel on cruise ships. Wall Street bracing for another wild week as the public health emergency threatens the economy, raising fears of a recession. World markets tumbling, oil prices plunging, the biggest crash in decades. And in New York, the family of the lawyer at the center of the state's outbreak breaks their silence. And a New Jersey patient battling the virus speaks this morning to GMA. This as fears of a pandemic grow. School districts closing around the country and the virus hitting the nation's capital. Senator Ted Cruz now under self-quarantine. Plus the big questions this morning about sporting events. The major tennis tournament canceled. Plus the unprecedented lockdowns. More than 16 million people in Italy under quarantine. Venice tourists told to stay indoors. Our team is there live and spread out across the globe. And Dr. Ashton is here on call, answering all your questions this morning. 2020 showdown. The two-man race for the Democratic nomination. Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders battling it out one day before six more states vote is Michigan must win for Sanders. And Harry and Meghan participating in their last royal event this morning, reuniting with family and the Queen after a whirlwind week of goodbyes. We are live in London as Harry and Meghan officially make their royal exit. Live in Times Square, this is Good Morning America. And we most certainly do say good morning, America. I hope everybody had a great weekend, and it's great to have TJ here with us. And good morning to you both. And we wake up once again of weekend and all this coronavirus news. Mm -hmm. We're getting these updates constantly. Yeah, you're here with a very busy start to the week. We are going to get straight to that coronavirus emergency. Here's what we know right now. Take a look at this live heat map from Johns Hopkins. It shows worldwide cases topping 110,000 this morning with at least 3,800 deaths. Cases here in the U.S. increasing sharply over the weekend, more than doubling. There are now at least 563 cases here and 22 fatalities. Also, Wall Street bracing for another rocky day. Global markets and oil prices plunging overnight. We will get to all of that with our Rebecca Jarvis in just a moment. It has been a rocky night. We're going to begin with those 3,500 people still on the Grand Princess cruise ship off the coast of California. At least 21 have tested positive for the virus, as the State Department is now warning all Americans to stay off cruise ships. ABC's Matt Gutman is at the Port of Oakland, where that ship is expected to dock today. Good morning, Matt. Hey, good morning, George. And what you're going to see at this port, right where those cranes are behind me, is an unprecedented public health effort. And it began overnight with teams boarding the Grand Princess to begin the triage of those passengers. It will continue today with this complex choreography of offloading the 2,400 passengers in a way that doesn't expose them to more of the virus. Now, this is one of the reasons that the federal government is now basically begging Americans not to go on cruise ships. This morning, that unprecedented warning from the State Department urging Americans to avoid taking cruise ships, especially people with underlying health concerns. Right now, not wait until yeah. things get worse. Say, no large crowds, no long trips, and above all, don't get on a cruise ship. Over the weekend, the CDC had been tracking four additional cruise ships, all ordered to remain offshore, including the Regal Princess. Scheduled to dock in Port Everglades on Sunday, it was feared a handful of crew might have been exposed on a previous trip aboard the Grand Princess, but the cruise line says none of the crew on those ships have had symptoms. And now all but a single ship has been cleared by the CDC. This coming as 3,500 Grand Princess passengers and crew will be quarantined for 14 days in various facilities. The ship's 1,100 crew members will remain on board, 19 of them testing positive for the virus. Meanwhile, only two of the 2,400 passengers have tested positive. That group will disembark at the Port of Oakland later today. After docking, we will then begin a disembarkation process specified by authorities that is likely to take several days. The most sick will be sent to hospitals while others taken to military bases in California and Georgia. President Trump has said that he would prefer if none of the passengers aboard these cruises landed on U.S. soil. Did he mention any of that to you? I had a private conversation with him and he said everything that I could have hoped for and every single thing he said 
they followed through on. On Sunday, hundreds of prescriptions delivered by boat, many going to the ship's more than 1,000 passengers over the age of 70, the most vulnerable cohort. And then, for the first time in four days, healthy passengers finally allowed out of their rooms. The waiting's been the uh, hardest part by far, and the inconvenience of possibly having to do another two weeks in isolation following this. Still, patients wearing thin on board. I kind of feel like we're floating around the drain just waiting here to get the virus. We haven't been tested. We want to be tested properly, and uh, we want to make sure uh, that we're safe. Now, the American passengers will do their quarantine in bases here in California and as far away as Georgia. Now, remember, there are people from 54 countries aboard this ship. They're going to have to be taken home on chartered flights. Now, for so many, this two-week quarantine is an unexpected addition to this voyage. Many people on the ship telling me they just want to go back home to their families, their dogs, and a normal routine. Um, guys. All right, don't blame her for that. Thank you, Matt. Now that the family of the New York lawyer at the center of the state's outbreak, we are hearing from that family for the first time this morning. Whit Johnson has the latest from outside the hospital here in Manhattan where the patient is still in critical condition. Good morning, Whit. Robin, good morning to you. The family of the patient that's being treated at this hospital behind me here says that they are very hopeful that he will make a full recovery. But the impact of this outbreak is being felt across the state. And now the mayor of New York City with an ominous warning that we could see hundreds of cases here within the next few weeks. This morning, Adina Garbuz, the wife of Lawrence Garbuz, the sickened attorney from New York's Westchester County, speaking out, saying her husband, who is hospitalized after contracting COVID-19, remains critical, but says she is very hopeful of his full recovery. Adina, who along with two of the couple's children, has tested positive for the virus, writing in a statement, when I first heard that Lawrence was positive, I immediately recognized there was going to be pandemonium all around us, adding, no one else in my family has been sick other than a slight cough. Adina says she believes her 50-year-old husband was run down and susceptible to the illness he acquired and says that as soon as she found out about his diagnosis, she contacted everyone in our firm and all were quarantined and have been working remotely ever since. Bob Kent lives just down the street from the family. Do you get the sense that people are anxious about what will happen next? Yes, I think people have pretty well decided that it's, in a sense, unstoppable. 32-year-old physician's assistant James Kai says he tested positive for the virus last week after attending a medical conference in New York City. When they are surprised, it can be turned out that bad so quickly, and, and I'm so young. I don't drink, I don't smoke. Meanwhile, the number of cases in New York growing to more than 100. On Saturday, an Uber driver, a man in his 30s, testing positive as well and is currently hospitalized in Queens. Uber saying it removed the man's access to the app and that it's working closely with public health authorities. Officials now working to identify the driver's passengers. Governor Cuomo declaring a state of emergency and taking aim at the CDC. CDC, wake up. Let the states test, let private labs test, let's increase as quickly as possible our testing capacity. Both Hofstra University and Columbia University are canceling classes for the remainder of the week after the exposure of some students and staff members there. And another school district in hard-hit Westchester County also shutting down for at least nine days following a positive test result for one of the teachers. TJ. All right, Whit, thank you so much. And the coronavirus emergency is threatening the global economy. This morning, we are keeping a close watch on Wall Street, and all signs are pointing to another rocky start. Rebecca Jarvis is tracking it for us there with the very latest. Rebecca, good morning to you. Good morning to you, TJ. That's right. If stocks stay where they are right now, it will be the worst day of trading so far this year. The Dow now down 1300 points overnight futures falling 5%. So here's what's happening over the weekend. OPEC called a meeting to discuss falling oil prices in the wake of coronavirus, which has sent prices lower. Those talks fizzled and the Saudi Arabians, rather than being supportive of oil prices, sent them plunging, setting off a price war here in the US. We are looking at the biggest down day for oil since the Gulf War, with prices down more than 20%. And while that's good news, 
if you're a consumer and taking to the roads, it is bad news for oil and energy companies, which rely on prices at slightly higher levels in order to make money off of their business. Now, 6.7 million Americans work for energy companies. Those energy companies have a huge amount of debt, and with that debt coming due, George, this is a bad time for them. It's also, if you look at the market right now, the market has now washed out its gains for the year down about 10 percent year to date, George. Rebecca Jarvis, thanks very much. In Washington, the coronavirus crisis has consumed the White House, and now it's hitting even closer to home. The president and vice president both appeared in an event where one attendee has tested positive for the virus. Our senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega has the latest. And Cecilia, the president and his team have been struggling to stay on the same page as they talk about coronavirus. Yeah, George, exactly. And this morning, the president appears to be increasingly agitated about all of this. He is sending his own messages on Twitter right now, saying the hysteria surrounding the coronavirus is designed to hurt him politically. This morning, the nation's capital reporting its first cases of coronavirus, but President Trump says he's not worried. Are you concerned that the virus is getting close to the White House? No, I'm not concerned at all. No, I'm not. You no, know, we've done a great job. It comes after a man who attended a conservative conference just outside Washington last week also tested positive, the president and vice president among the speakers. But while the White House says there is no indication they were in close proximity to the attendee, Texas Senator Ted Cruz says he did briefly speak to and shake hands with the infected man. Cruz says he feels fine, but he's now under voluntary self-quarantine at home. And this morning, the Trump administration under fire for mixed messages. The president says his rallies will go on. They will have tremendous rallies. But from the nation's top infectious disease expert, this warning. If we continue to see the community spread go up, I think you need to seriously look at anything that's a large gathering. And about that cruise ship off the coast of San Francisco. If it were up to me, I would be inclined to say, leave everybody on the ship for a period of time and you use the ship as your base. Absolutely not. I recommend it very strongly in our meetings that we get those people off that ship. Members of the president's coronavirus task force struggling to answer questions. They are coming up with a plan within 72 hours of that meeting. Uh, the it's, ship's docking it's, tomorrow. The plan will be in place by that time. But I don't, I don't want to uh, preview the plan right now. Shouldn't you be able to do that? I think, I think it needs to all come from uh, a solitary source. The president is adamant there are enough tests to go around. They have the tests, and the tests are beautiful. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. But at that hard-hit nursing home in Washington state, a spokesman says that's not the case. We still are not testing our employees uh, inside. We don't have test kits to do that. We would like to be able to test our employees. Now, White House aides are not saying whether anyone here, including the president himself, has been tested, but they do say, George, that every precaution is being taken to keep the president, the first family, and the White House complex safe. Okay, Cecilia, thanks. Let's bring in our chief medical correspondent, Dr. Jen Ashton, President Trump's former Homeland Security Advisor, Tom Boston. And Jen, let me begin with you. Yeah. Cecilia just illustrated the kind of mixed messaging we've been seeing. And this morning, the president's saying this is really about the media raising hysteria. Well, yeah, and I'm hearing that from people literally who are stopping me on the street with the same kind of comments. But you have to look at things that are non-media, governments, not just here, but all over the world, the biggest companies in the world and the actions that they're taking, schools, universities. It's not, we, we are just reporting what is going on, and we have to understand that this is a dynamic and evolving situation, and it's not at the polar end of extremes. It's not the end of the world, but it's certainly not nothing either, and we don't have a crystal ball, so we don't know where this is heading. And have to be vigilant. Let me bring in Tom Bosser for more on this. Tom, just take us inside uh, the White House. If you were inside right now, what's the number one thing you'd be recommending to the president? There is no question the number one role for me, if I were back in that building, would be to get people to stop looking backwards. There's a lot of discussion about what we've done wrong or could have done better, and instead to start looking forward. This is a leadership opportunity for the president to paint for the American people a picture of what it's going to look like in a number of weeks, months, up to a year. Now, uh, Dr. Ashton's correct, we don't have a crystal ball, but that's what leaders are for. And I think it's fair to say, without being an alarmist, that at least the math, at least the numbers, suggest that we are anywhere from eight days to two weeks from being in an exponential growth environment. Not quite Italy uh, today, but maybe Italy a week or two ago. So Tom, what's the threshold for telling people in a city or a region to stay at home, to self-quarantine? 
Uh, Robin, I, there's two really. So once we start seeing human to human transmission, it's a pretty good indicator that there's been a virus circulating in their community for some period of time. But death is the really unfortunately lagging indicator here. Once we see a death, it's pretty certain that we've had that virus circulating for a period of weeks. Now that's not perfect science, but it's a really good indicator of when we should start locking down. And Jen, okay, we all know we're supposed to be washing our hands yeah. constantly, not touching our face. That's the that's what an individual can sure. do. But as, as parents are looking ahead to spring break, yeah. cancellations, what kind of things should we be thinking about? Well, I about? think to, to dovetail off Tom's comment, you know, we can start to act on a community level in a microcosm, whether it's your family, your community, and try to not just protect ourselves, but buffer those vulnerable populations. So for me personally, I'm keeping my college-age kids away from my 80-plus-year-old parents for a while. Okay, Jen Ash. And thanks very much. And all of you can send in your coronavirus questions on Twitter and Instagram all morning long with the hashtag AskGMA. Dr. Jen's going to answer some of them live in our next half hour. Right. Meanwhile, George, the race for the White House now. Voters will head to the polls in six states tomorrow. And Joe Biden heading into the primaries with big momentum and new endorsements as Bernie Sanders takes a make or break stand in the state of Michigan. Eva Pilgrim has the latest. Get up! Let's take back this country! We are are capable of making sweeping change if we have the courage to do it. This morning, the last two men standing in the race for the Democratic nomination are gearing up for another set of critical contests. The next president of the United States, Joe Biden. Joe Biden still riding high after a Super Tuesday surge, boosted by support from black voters. If I'm a comeback kid, there's only one reason I'd come back. The African American community all around the country. The former vice president picking up another big name supporter. Join me in supporting Joe and let's get this done. Senator Kamala Harris releasing this video backing Biden, his ninth endorsement from a former rival. Senator Bernie Sanders is hoping to chip away at Biden's overwhelming support from black voters, picking up an endorsement from civil rights icon Jesse Jackson. I stand with him because he stands with you. The biggest prize up for grabs this week is Michigan. Both candidates campaigning hard, hoping to prove their popularity with the Rust Belt voters who could decide the election in November. Let us go forward on Tuesday. Let's win here in Michigan. But for Sanders, in desperate need of a big win, the stakes here couldn't be higher. We're taking on the political establishment. We're going to win this election. And just moments ago, Cory Booker formally endorsing Joe Biden, tweeting, he'll show us there's more that unites us than divides us. Guys. Wow, 10th former candidate to endorse Joe Biden. Thank you, Eva. We're following a lot of other stories this morning, including Harry and Meghan's final royal engagement. That's happening today. And we'll have more on the coronavirus, the massive quarantine in Italy, millions on lockdown, and big questions about sporting, major sporting events. But first, let's check in with Ginger. Good morning. And who is ready for some spring? Should we do this? Valentine, Nebraska hit 80 degrees their first of the season. Look where we're going today. Some of the warmer. We had a little peak in January, but near 70 in New York City. Your local weather in 30 seconds. First, the Select Cities, sponsored by CarMax. It's no big deal, really. That little vent that won't stay open, it's not like the engine doesn't work. Just position the other vents so they're aimed at you. It's no big deal. Except it is. That little vent that won't stay open is like a little window of your automotive happiness boarded shut. That's why the vent is one more thing we check before a car can be a certified CarMax car. Because that's the way it should be. CarMax. Get ready for a warm day. Get ready for a warm week. Out the door this morning, though, a little chilly, so you might need the jacket, but by late morning, you'll probably lose that jacket. From the 40s to the mid-50s, and then on to the lower 70s today, with pretty much full sunshine today. Clouds tomorrow, some showers starting at about 7 or 8 a.m. tomorrow morning and continuing on and off. And then we're back to sunshine for Wednesday with some rain coming in at night and a few showers by the end of the work week. Not a bad week, though. Warmest out of the year so far. Two, two seconds? Two, two. We'll be back. We'll be, we'll, two seconds.